I'd like to call the uh, special meeting of the City Council of the City of Victorville to order. First item is public comment. Anyone wishing to address the uh, Council under public comment? Item is item number two, uh, discussion regarding city finances and Mr. Cox. We have a presentation that the Deputy Manager, Doug Robinson, is going to make to the Council, and I'm sure there'll be Plenty of questions, and we'll be available for questions after the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mayor and Council, uh, uh, a few weeks ago I made a comment to Councilman McEachran that I was hoping to put together kind of a financial update for the Council. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, Tuesday night, he put that on the record to make sure that we did it, and here we are to do it. Um, I do have a confession that this is not the full, complete, absolute, sorted-out financial report that I think I had in mind when we discussed it. Uh, however, uh, going through this process will help us get to that point. Uh, in fact, uh, there are several members of our finance department who are working on just such a report, and some of the direction that we receive from you tonight, or at least consensus, uh, will help us uh, complete that report. Uh, what this is is more of uh, kind of a, a look at the, the cash balance of the city uh, and the city's uh, entities that, uh, that this board governs. Um, and it uh, is somewhat uh, the guts of the city's accounting system, if you will, on paper. Um, and I've tried to call out uh, some of the sections that I've highlighted in the PowerPoint. So if you'll allow me to, uh, to continue with that. Um, the picture of the city's budget when it was first conceived back in uh, May, June of last year has changed significantly. Um, Partially due to national and world uh, economic declines, our sales taxes are down 12% over what was originally budgeted. Um, that is a figure of about $2.3 million uh, estimated at, at year end uh, that is not going to be there. Um, there was uh, included in the budget a one-time anticipated sale of equipment at Foxborough to the tune of about $25 million. Um, although there has been some very minor sales of equipment or pending sales of equipment, uh, that is revenue that is, is not going to be realized before the end of the fiscal year. Um, lastly, as far as revenue declines, there was a one-time anticipated revenue, as you're all familiar with, from the sale of Victorville II uh, that was budgeted at about $82 million. And that appears in the cash balance report as some negative numbers, uh, and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, uh, for good news, uh, we actually had some unbudgeted revenues that we were not anticipating. Um, partially uh, due to uh, base property tax monies that came from VITA uh, that were part of our subsidiary districts that have now uh, either been uh, dissolved or are in the process, the very last process of being dissolved. That amount was $6.5 million. That total is actually for fiscal years 07 and 08 combined that had not hit the city's general ledger, or if it had, it wasn't uh, appropriately uh, documented in there. Um, then uh, the second item that you see there is dissolution of the subsidiary districts. The sanitary district uh, for years has collected a property tax. Uh, however, all of its revenues uh, that it collects through user fees have paid for all the operations and capital. So the property tax has uh, sort of sat there, if you will. And upon its dissolution in September, um, that property tax and the uh, operation portion of their budget became essentially a part of the general fund as a matter of course. Uh, not all of that accounting work has taken place. It's, these are the sorts of cleanup items that typically take place uh, towards the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so some of these items, although they will appear uh, as they maybe would have before the dissolution, uh, before the end of the fiscal year, those things will be cleaned up and it will show as part, of the, uh, as part of the general fund. Yes, Mayor. Yeah, the tax, though, will continue. Yes, that tax continues as uh, general fund city property tax. Uh, from here on out. From September on, uh, that became general fund property tax. And in fact, uh, upon the, the final notice of completion of the dissolution of the fire district and rec and park district, uh, the two actions that you took uh, two weeks ago uh, essentially caused that final completion to be done. Once we received notice from LAFCO that it has been complete, uh, those property taxes that used to go to those districts will become general fund city property taxes. So we will no longer be a, quote, no property tax city. Um, one thing I want to make very, very clear both to you and to our audience is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, neither Ryan nor I, and I know you, uh, Mayor Cabriales, had made a mention of, of wanting this report as well, knew exactly 
what bad timing it would turn out to be for a cash balance report. Uh, that has to do with the fact that at the end of May, literally within two weeks, we'll receive a large chunk of the funding that the city and the RDA and the subsidiary districts receive through the property tax. Um, that funding has not occurred yet, um, but because we're so deep into the fiscal year, we probably have spent somewhere in the order of magnitude of 80, 85 percent of our expenditures have gone out. But the revenues that have come in are probably closer to 50 percent of the revenues. So as we look at this report, many of the negative numbers will only be negative for another week or two. And once those large funding sources come in, they'll immediately flip back around. Not all of them, and we'll discuss those uh, towards the end of the, of the presentation. Um, the other issue that, that we have, and it's been uh, exacerbated somewhat with the transfer of uh, the VITA's treasurer function to Apple Valley. Uh, the SELAA bonds uh, come due, a large payment in December, about $16 million, and then a large payment uh, at essentially the end of May, June 1st, I think it is, um, of about $10 million, $9 to $10 million. The funds that are used to pay that is collected by VITA and then distributed. Uh, but in years past, it's always been distributed in September of the following year. It's this year's dollars, so it could be accrued this year, but it's actually not funded from VITA to Victorville, to Apple Valley, to Hesperia, to SCLAA until uh, a few months into next fiscal year. Uh, and we're actually looking at an interim distribution, I believe, uh, Thursday night uh, through VITA uh, to take care of that problem for this year. And then also I've recommended that they have a discussion about maybe changing the way that that funding comes in so that we can realize that, that funding, that important funding in the same fiscal year in which it's actually collected. So um, I would like to take a time out, though, and just thank uh, some members of the team that I kind of brought together to go th over this issue with me and to take a look at these things. Uh, Keith Metzler, our Economic Development Director, uh, Sophie Gates, his Assistant Director, uh, Adele Mosier, our Assistant Director of Finance, and Francine Millinder. Uh, our finance manager, and then Steve Barlman, who's the assistant director of water slash uh, CFO of water, all got together to kind of sift through this cash balance report and come up with uh, some of the ideas that would, that would keep us current through the end of the fiscal year. Um, calling out just certain sections, this is kind of the very first part of the first page there. And this is where it, it's, it looks a lot more troubling than it is uh, based on, on the timing of those things. Um, the, uh, as you can see, the, the combination of the general fund, fire, rec and park, sanitary districts um, as on a strictly cash basis are at a negative $3 million uh, as of May 4th. Um, that will resolve out. Uh, the VMUS, Victorville Municipal Utility Fund, is at a negative $21 million. <coughs> um, that we would expect to go up slightly um, over the next month. Um, and then uh, the SCLA. Uh, that is a combination of uh, the, the DDA payment to Sterling for the Dr. Pepper uh, land and also uh, payment made to back up the uh, payment for the GE uh, turbines uh, that the city put a down payment on and are still uh, in, in question um, as to the exact resolution of that. Um, that negative $53 million total will be resolved somewhat by the end of the fiscal year and we'll get into that in just a, just a few minutes. Uh, the water district uh, was healthy before coming to the city. It remains healthy now um, under your governance, and we don't anticipate that changing in the future. Um, although there has been, because of the negative balances and some of the other funds, there has been some informal borrowing that's taken place, which is typical for all cities uh, as uh, funding sources uh, ebb and flow throughout the year. Um, and we are, would be looking to formalize some of those uh, loan relationships, and I'll get into that just a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Say that you would borrow money from the water district? That is something that uh, we are looking for part of the discussion tonight uh, and a recommendation that, uh, that I'll be making later on, yes. Near the end of the presentation, we will be pointing out that there has been informal borrowing from funds and it needs to be formalized that goes to the council in the form of a resolution with council approvals showing that it's a debt, therefore a receivable, and we have to show a plan that guarantees that that money can be paid back. Right, right, and it's not something that 
ever was the intent during this budget year to happen, but it is a, the realization that we've come to based on, on the downturn in, in the economy and on some of these other one-time revenue sources uh, not being realized. Uh, our development impact fee funds um, have, are, are up and down both. Uh, the public buildings, DIF, uh, most of that negative balance is uh, sort of a prepayment for uh, City Hall uh, and the expansion and will be paid uh, in future years from uh, future development impact fees. Um, same thing with fire service diff, the fire station we're building now and the fire station we built just a few years ago. Typically, and I think Rudy probably remembers this from when he was the chief, typically you build the station with diff funds that you don't, haven't quite captured yet and then as they come in they repay those debts. Uh, most of that can be handled informally um, and to the degree that a formal loan is necessary, we'll take a look at that at a future meeting. Uh, Measure I funds are, are still healthy and we're using those funds to, to uh, do not only road maintenance as appropriate, but also build roads as well. Uh, the RDA on the whole is uh, doing very well uh, with $41 million cash in bank. Uh, however, a significant portion of that money uh, will be used to pay back what showed up as a negative in SCLA and it is done so appropriately, it's done every year just hasn't happened yet this fiscal year from an accounting standpoint. So as I mentioned, this is somewhat kind of the guts of the accounting system before all of the end of year moving of money happens. Um, the uh, SLA bond proceeds uh, is, although it has a large dollar amount there, uh, all of that is likely uh, to ultimately be housing set aside monies that can't be spent on other projects without a formal loan being put in place. Uh, so how do we resolve these negative balances? Uh, the general fund and districts uh, that are, are no longer, um, we believe, are actually going to resolve themselves between now and June 30th uh, with the additional uh, property tax dollars that come in over the next couple of weeks. We believe those are going to be back to positive. We would have expected that anyway. Um, so those are going to be just fine. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, at this point, end of year balance is estimated at $8.3 million. Um, that does not include any expenditures that occur between now and then, so I would expect that to be a little bit lower than that uh, from a cash standpoint when we get there. That was just meant to show the, the revenues that, that, that have not been realized yet that kind of cloud this report a little bit and make it a little bit confusing. Uh, Victorville Municipal Utility uh, has been uh, informally called uh, a part of the general fund. It is actually uh, somewhat a separate fund, an enterprise fund um, that the council entered into and knowingly went into the hole, not as far as what, as what we actually have, uh, but uh, for, for a temporary basis, we're recommending a loan from the water district of uh, approximately $20 million. The remaining uh, informal borrowing that has to take place then, that million dollars, maybe slightly higher than that at the end of the fiscal year, uh, can actually be handled, and I've spoken with the auditors about this, it can be handled on an informal basis as it has been in the past. In fact, next year, uh, in fact, uh, the, the budget team, Mr. Cox, myself, and some of the individuals that I mentioned earlier who were on this team as well, um, have just completed literally half an hour ago our last initial budget meeting with department heads. So we have completed at least the first meeting and we'll likely be scheduling more meetings to talk about uh, some further cuts, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, in talking with water, uh, and uh, with Mr. Barrowman, the water is able to survive this next fiscal year with essentially no impact on cash, meaning that the revenues that they take in will be expended next year, but they don't anticipate using any of their reserves uh, that uh, will still be available, the $13 million that would still be available or this $20 million. Uh, although it would be written up uh, based on, on your concurrence tonight, it would be written up as a formal loan from VMUS to water, we would anticipate that uh, once the economy turns a little bit and the general fund is, is back uh, in a positive cash flow, um, that it would likely be repaid by the general fund and VMUS would transfer back over to being more of a general fund department uh, and until such time as their revenues uh, pay all of that loan back. Um, at, at this point, I believe the initial estimate was revenues of about $1.5 million over expenditures for next fiscal year, meaning that that uh, informal loan could be paid back next fiscal year and then the other uh, 20 million dollars that would be loaned uh, by first water then the general fund could be paid back over time as as the utility grows 
Um, that takes care of kind of the operations side, the general fund side um, of, of those negative balances. The other side uh, was the, the, that SCLA figure. Um, that's taken care of by a, a couple of, of measures. One is uh, uh, through that uh, VITA distribution that I mentioned that would be uh, coming out Thursday, as well as transfers that would normally take place anyway to cover uh, those debt service payments uh, from uh, from the RDA, from uh, the VITA funds that Victorville uh, still holds as, as part of its RDA. Um, the other, uh, the remainder uh, piece of that would be about $32 million, it looks like. And uh, I would like to have been able to have the time to work with the staff a little bit more on, on detailing this. But uh, I know that Keith and Sophie have worked very hard at uh, putting together a 26-month cash flow meaning the rest of this year and the next two fiscal years, to show that uh, in the event that nothing happens with Victorville II over that time frame, they can cash flow this uh, borrowing that needs to take place. And to the extent that formal loans are necessary, they're prepared to put those in place. Um, we're very close to having that and would hope to have that uh, in the near future to bring forward to you guys as, as kind of a funding plan for the retirement of that, of that $32 million debt over time. Um, so what's the purpose of these loans? Uh, specifically, uh, a couple of reasons. Number one is to protect the road diff funds that are allocated to La Mesa and Esqually, which has been the council's number one priority for some time now. And we are uh, crossing my fingers, getting close, and hopefully to start construction next fiscal year. Um, I'm told that the earliest it would start would be January uh, of 2010. Uh, but I'm not promised that, and I'm not promising you that tonight. <laughs> um, uh, the other issue that, that is at hand is to protect the restricted funds from being borrowed informally. That's one of the, the key things that the auditors do take a look at at the end of the fiscal year as they set up uh, the end of year borrowing that, that resolves any little minor uh, negative balances. They make sure that in resolving those minor negative balances that restricted funds are still restricted and they're not, uh, they're not spent on inappropriate uh, uh, expenditures. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we may need some future short-term borrowing, and to the extent that we do, we will absolutely bring forward formal loan documents to be drawn up and approved by the council and in your capacity sitting as one of the other boards. Um, and they will draw interest uh, at a minimum of the LAFE rate, which is what those entities are earning right now. Um, and that does two things. Number one, it gives some comfort, I think, to the folks from the water district who've been with the water district for a long time. I think that it also gives some comfort to the auditors that we're uh, managing our money correctly. Um, and it also uh, makes sure that as we move forward that things are very clear so that when we get ready to present you with a formal financial report, all these things have, uh, have had decisions made on exactly where this borrowing occurs. Um, La Mesa and Esqually. Uh, this was one of the key reasons for putting this together was to be able to ensure that uh, only the appropriate funds are spent on La Mesa and Esqually and that we have the appropriate funds on hand in order to do so when we start construction next fiscal year. The road diff on hand, if you recall from a little bit earlier in the presentation, was $16.7 million. Uh, we anticipate receiving approximately $350,000 more this fiscal year uh, between now and the end of the fiscal year. Um, and then over the next three years, with uh, construction starting next fiscal year and completion to about 24 months after that, um, you can see the totals. Uh, now, when I first saw those uh, from our city engineer, I thought, come on, Sean, you have got to be just over-exaggerating these monies. And he, he assured me, no, 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 we're actually tracking higher than what those estimates are right now. Those estimates, one quarter of that estimate is based on housing, uh, new housing starts essentially. And it's, uh, those numbers are based on 200 new homes annually. As you may be aware, in April we had permits pulled for 80 new homes already. Um, and we're tracking higher than 200 new homes for this year. And we would anticipate that uh, even though this is a very conservative uh, number, it may not look like it up there, but it actually is very conservative figures, um, we would hope, I think all of us are, that uh, sometime in the 2011-12 uh, time frame, the economy begins to, to make some significant progress. And uh, the total road diff that comes in during those years actually is enough to fully fund the $30 million that's needed. Uh, if not, uh, we can tap 
uh, the local transportation fund through a loan. A uh, formal loan document would be drawn up if necessary uh, in probably 2011-12. Um, or if necessary for simply for cash flow purposes. The local transportation fund is part of Measure I and it's the part that pays for transit. And the way that it works is that you have a certain amount of what they call transit obligation. Once that obligation is met, any remaining funds can be used for road projects, road maintenance, road building. Um, and although we would like to just simply spend those dollars on the La Mesa Nisqually interchange, uh, because the 50% share that we have to come up with, the $30 million, is matching the 50% share, the $30 million that, that comes from Measure I, uh, our share has to be paid by, quote, the developer fee. Um, and because of that, we would loan that into road diff, uh, much like uh, there's been a loan to the public buildings diff in order to, to satisfy that debt. We would loan that temporarily until the, the road diff fee uh, uh, came back in an amount to pay it back, at which point we could then use that money on, on a different road, uh, potentially on uh, the Green Tree Extension, which is all part of uh, one large project there, eventually getting to the Ecoloma Bridge crossing into Apple Valley. Um, the total funding available over the next three fiscal years, as you can see, is, is about $35 million. So we do have a little bit of cushion there. Um, something that we uh, could rely on, although we choose not to, uh, would be a loan from Measure I. Um, if this absolutely fell apart, um, we could do that. It's not something that's preferable. Uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, we're ready to build La Mesa Nisqually, I don't think that, uh, that drawing up a loan document is something that would, would slow down the council. Uh, revenues for 09-10, uh, um, after meeting with all the department heads, we wanted to give the council a sense and actually try to see if we could get some discussion about next year, uh, basically. Uh, as I mentioned, there is one-time revenues in this year's that we are going to count as part of this year's budget now um, that are helping make the general fund whole uh, at the end of June 30th. Uh, however, those are not going to be available next year. Um, at the end of this fiscal year, we're estimating a total expenditure of, of $56.5 million. That includes any transfers to other funds like park and rec, fire fund, those sorts of things. Um, next year, the general fund revenue estimate is about $43 million, meaning that there is a difference of 13, big numbers there, I know you can read, $13.4 million that uh, will not be available next year unless we cut existing expenditure levels. To, to meet that revenue figure. Uh, and that is part of the reason why our budget process is, is grueling right now, uh, is because we are, uh, every department head has submitted uh, potential cuts uh, and we are not there yet. Um, if I had to guess, and this is based on the last week and a half of meeting with department heads and some very, very preliminary numbers from those meetings, I think we're maybe halfway there uh, with just simply program type cuts. From, from our department heads. And although that's, that's a heck of a feat to come up with six to seven million dollars, we're still uh, in need of additional cuts. Uh, the la next slides are the ones that the employees behind me are gonna shoot me for. Uh, they're not intended to be proposed cuts. They are simply a discussion of benefit levels and we wanted to, to try to spur some kind of a discussion from the council so that we have some, some concurrence, some idea for which way we should head with regard to uh, any potential cuts that we bring forward later on. Uh, uh, we run through our an annual benefit costs. Um, these are based uh, a lot on salaries. One thing to keep in mind that that $13 million or roughly six to $7 million that we're still uh, looking for is just the general fund. So for these amounts, from a general sense, only one third of the dollars that are spent on these benefits actually come from the general fund. Uh, the rest of them come from other uh, restricted funds or the water district or uh, the airport funds, uh, the RDA. Um, so to the extent that we make any cuts globally, uh, keep in mind that those cuts only fill the gap by about one third of, of the numbers that you see up here. 401A plan is uh, similar to a 401K plan in businesses. Uh, 2.5 uh, or 5% of salary for a manager and higher uh, is deposited into, into this uh, fund. Each employee has his or her own uh, printout that they get. Uh, and then uh, employees are allowed to uh, invest that money into different mutual funds. Um, that's the, uh, the city share 
uh, some employees have opted to also contribute additional dollars into that into their piece of that fund. <coughs> Excuse me. Cell phone allowance. Um, we're just kind of running through every benefit that uh, that employees or any number of employees receive. Uh, is uh, anywhere from $25 to $100, depending on usage. I know uh, some of you uh, enjoy this benefit, as do uh, all of our department heads and, and most of our senior staff, as well as uh, folks that go out in the field. Uh, that uh, amount is $120,000, as you can see there. Uh, similarly, auto allowance um, is either $250 or to $400, uh, depending on use and title. Typically, directors receive $400 a month in auto allowance and assistant directors and managers receive $250 per month. Uh, that annual total is $124,000. Okay, now we're getting into some benefit areas that get a little bit more complicated, um, mostly because some of these things have changed over the years and they were put in place to address a problem that was seen a few years ago that have now turned into a problem of their own sort of a, a unforeseen consequences, unintended consequences. HMO subsidy is, is something that's really not listed as a benefit, um, but it is a cost to the city. Uh, the intent was to offer a health benefit plan to all employees uh, that would cover themselves and their entire family with no cash out of pocket. Uh, the way the cafeteria plan works, I'm sure all of you are familiar, for those in the audience who are unfamiliar, um, you get a certain dollar amount to use towards your benefits. And to the extent that you elect benefits that are higher than that dollar amount, that cash comes out of your pocket. Um, what the city attempted to do a few years ago as benefit costs were rising is come up with a way to kind of freeze that benefit level. So what they did was for the HMO, uh, the HealthNet HMO plan, uh, the city froze that, that dollar amount that employees would have to pay and then on the back end picked it up as a subsidy. Um, what the result is that any employee has at least one option that they can pay for them and their family with no cash out of pocket through the cafeteria plan. Uh, however, it has resulted and as benefit costs have gone up, this has been amplified. Uh, it has resulted in uh, some employees receiving a higher level of benefit from a dollar amount than other employees. Uh, so someone who may be sitting right next to me may only, may, we both may be receiving $626 a month for our cafeteria plan, but if, if Joe next to me chooses the Kaiser plan, which is not part of this, then Joe next to me is paying another $300 to $400 a month for that benefit. Um, and uh, that is an issue that, as I mentioned, as the, the dollar amount continues to rise, it, it, it amplifies that, that problem. Uh, the benefit cash out uh, is approximately $300,000 that employees opt, who opt out of the medical plan altogether are, they can receive partial cash back up to $313, depending on exactly what level of benefit that they, that they choose to, to take. Um, stability pay is something that uh, has gone away in a lot of cities. Um, it's essentially... Uh, for long-term employees, it begins after your fifth year of employment with the City of Victorville, and it's calculated based on 2% times your years of service times your monthly pay, and it's payable once annually, uh, magically just before Christmas, um, and is, I guess, intended to be somewhat of a Christmas uh, uh, cash bonus. Um, and that, uh, as you can see there, is about $365,000. Uh, other potential cuts, and now we get even more complicated. The Friday furlough is something that is not well understood by uh, the public. I think the employees, for the most part, understand it. Um, and I don't know how many of you understand it, so let me give my best shot as to how we arrived where we are right now. Um, at the end of last fiscal year, uh, the city essentially cut work hours back by 10%. Um, but in order to ease that pain on the employees, uh, chose to, rather than cutting salaries by 10%, chose to forego cost of living increases until cost of living increased by at least 10%. So in essence, the, the cities were receiving a bit of a subsidy and it, it worked out depending on how you wanted to look at, at it that uh, you know their, their hourly rate went up, but their monthly rate was frozen. So. On July 1, employees should have received a 3.3% cost of living adjustment, uh, and they didn't receive that. Instead, they received an extra day off uh, 
twice a month, uh, in essence. Um, that, that negative 10 percent represents that that cost of living that essentially was owed by the employees, if you will. Um, the this fiscal year's COLA is represented there at the 3.3 percent. And uh, unfortunately, uh, something that has really complicated matters is that uh, the time period that the city looks at for the COLA uh, increase is actually a decrease for next fiscal year. Uh, and looking back at the last 20 years of history uh, of, of COLAs awarded to employees, uh, I, I never saw, we haven't seen that before. So in essence, if we were just trundling along as we always had, getting a COLA each July 1 to keep up with cost of living, uh, the employees' salaries would actually have to come down 1% in order to keep up with the cost of living, um, which, which is odd. Um, so the remainder after this fiscal year would have been 6.7% that the employees still owed the city, if you will. Um, because of that, uh, that change, it would actually be an equivalent of 7.7%. So should the council choose to make those Friday furloughs an actual furlough without uh, the additional pay to freeze benefits and actually reduce pay, it would be the equivalent of a 7.7 percent salary reduction, which would result in savings of $2.3 million uh, to the city citywide. Um, another employee benefit uh, that we enjoy, as do most employees in other cities, is uh, the PERS, the way that uh, cities pay PERS is that uh, the, uh, the employer, the city, pays a certain percentage of the employee's salary, and the employee is then responsible for a, a different separate percentage. Um, most cities in California, um, and I'm going out on, on a little bit of a limb because I haven't done that research, but uh, most cities in California, I believe, actually pick up that employee cost as well as a part of doing business at a part of the, bene part of the benefits package. Uh, Victorville does that as well. Um, one option, again, I'm not advocating for any of this, necessarily, it's just up there for discussion, would be to have the employees pay that employee share. Uh, in essence, the employee's benefit level would not change. It would be a reduction in salary, the equivalent of 8.6 reduction in uh, percent reduction in salary. That is also expected to increase in future years. Uh, and it's something that uh, we hope to come forward uh, later this or in next month uh, with you, to you with uh, an estimate from PERS as to what, what that share would be. Uh, in future years. Um, if you were interested in looking at straight salary reductions, as has been suggested by some department heads, you can see the payroll figures there uh, as to what each of those salary reductions would bring uh, as far as savings to the city. However, keep in mind that only about one-third of that would actually benefit the general fund uh, as savings. That concludes uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I think there was some desire to to foster some discussion about the really the two items that are at hand. One is the borrowing uh, to get some concurrence uh, on on the borrowing scheme so that we can bring it back to you uh, at a later council meeting, and then also to get some discussion going as to where you'd like to uh, see the staff uh, and the manager head with uh, any potential uh, cuts. So. Yes, you said you already you were already through your. Department heads have reduced by seven out of the 13, about half. Yeah, it, very rough calculation, probably in the six million dollar range, give or take uh, 500,000. Deficit. The, the, the difference that we still need is probably another six to seven million dollars, somewhere in that range. We're looking at here. Yeah, that's that's what we're looking at here. Um, and again, those numbers are very very preliminary. Um, I need to caution you on that uh, because it's and almost more of an uh, accounting tape uh, rather than a full-fledged spreadsheet that's, that's got those all together at this point. Still going back and... There will be further meetings to discuss additional cuts, yes. Yes, these were more of the, more of a global uh, variety of cuts and we're hoping to just get some input from the council on, on uh, thoughts on uh, any of these uh, these issues. Question? I don't have any questions if you're looking for dialogue. <coughs> First component of this, the idea of formalizing shifting of funds through various loan concepts that's used a lot in lots of municipalities and businesses. As one member of the council, I, I do not have a problem 
uh, with that, I mean, the sack of money, if you will, <coughs> belongs to the residents of the city of Victorville. And if we can find a way to properly, uh, on a temporary basis, use those funds to maximize uh, the delivery of services, uh, it seems to me that that is a prudent thing to do as opposed to getting caught up in a very rigid uh, categorization of funds. And even though you may have a $6 million surplus in Fund X, not able to utilize that to fund uh, some important municipal service in some other category. So at least as one member of the council, the, the idea that you've suggested of formalizing uh, interfund transfers, uh, uh, loans and loan documents, it, it seems to me to be a prudent approach. Thank you, Councilman Caldwell. And in fact, one thing I want to mention is that although it would be written up as long-term loans, uh, because of the volatile nature of our revenues right now, we would actually prefer to revisit those on a semi-annual basis to see if we can resolve those quicker than, than what the loan documents may, may indicate. Doug, in looking at this uh, report, mm -hmm. uh, it indicates a date on the first page of uh, May 4th, 2009? Yes. That's correct? Yes. But on the last page, it talks about bank reconciliation has not occurred for April 30th, 2009. Correct. Are, are these numbers are just estimates or? Uh, it's, if you want to look at this as one large uh, checking account, this is essentially what your register says, but the accountant has not yet gone through and checked every single line item with the bank record that we have received. So this is what we would anticipate it being, uh, unless there's some kind of an anomaly, some kind of a mistake made, uh, that would be uh, caught as part of the bank reconciliation. But typically the reconciliation isn't, there's not big shifts or, or swings in funds. It's more a matter of checking each debit and credit against what you have in the record. Okay. And is also my understanding that the VITA funds have been transferred to the town of Apple Valley, yet that shows on the last page here is, my understanding of that correct? Yes and no. I think that they are going to be transferred, and I'm going to have to rely on somebody behind me, and I'm not sure who it is yet, but I believe they're going to be transferred later this week. Okay, yeah, Thursday there would be the transfer, and in fact, after the transfer would be uh, when the interim distribution is made in order to cover those, those bond funds that have been paid this year. The transfer of those funds includes our share of Exactly, yeah. The, don't get it back until. Right. The transfer of the funds will happen on Thursday. Uh, and in fact, I don't know if there is a check coming back to us for what is your absolutely correct, a majority of our funds, uh, or if just a, the difference is being transferred over to Apple Valley. And I'm going to rely on Adele again to answer that one. Okay. What, so, what amount is that? Uh, that the whole amount back. is approximately $54 million, if I remember correctly, from a discussion about an hour ago. Uh, and then they will then cut a check back to, uh, to Victorville for its portion of those uh, VITA dollars uh, in the distribution. What's that amount, though? $22 million. Yeah, because it's not completely reconciled until September, uh, the amount that would be transferred back would be uh, essentially 85% of, of the amount we would expect to receive uh, typically in September. And the reason for that is because in case there are some, some, some changes uh, in what uh, we anticipate between now and, and the end of June, we would hate to do a 100% uh, transfer back to each member entity. It's not just us. It's also Apple Valley, Hesperia, the school districts, uh, other uh, uh, special districts. We'd hate to have to go back to one of them and say, hey, there was a reconciliation error or some other issue, and you actually, now that you've spent the money, owe it, owe it back to, to the other VITA member entities. That's increment for, it, for the city share, as well as SCLA is, what, about 66%? Right around there, yes. That's what we yes. can expect. To get yes, back. that's what we can expect to get back. Um, on several occasions in con conversations with yourself as well as uh, Mr. Cox, we've talked about this cash report and how you can't have negative 
cash balances. Never figured that one out. I'm, I, I know that uh, <laughs> cash and bank, and we're negative 19 million in the general fund. You talked about how we have revenues coming in. When when are we going to realize those revenues? Because I mean, we're already at the end of May, getting to go into June, almost at the end of our fiscal year, and and you indicated that we should see the general fund turn around with those revenues that we'll realize. Um, should we expect by June 30 that the, in essence, all the funds that are referred to in uh, the general fire rec park, rec and parks, golf courses, um, will be a positive number? Um, essentially what will happen is between now and June 30th, the amount that you see there at just over $15 million in sanitary district operations, those dollars will become part of the general fund. They actually, that actually, from a legal sense, occurred in September. It's just that the accounting hasn't yet taken place. So that, is, that will satisfy the majority of that $19 million that you see there, something that the accounting staff has known about as they move forward throughout this fiscal year. Um, but it, it's more a matter of it's easier to do all of these things at once. And typically, this would take place right around June 30th or maybe even a little bit thereafter in preparation for next year's audit. Um, the other significant portion of funding that I mentioned is actually property tax money. And as you know, you pay, you can pay your property tax in two, in two uh, large amounts. Uh, those actually are distributed to cities, districts, school districts, VEDA, everyone in December and at the end of May. And that's why it's, as I had mentioned, it's a really bad time to look at, at these funds on a cash basis. This is essentially what amounts to a printout of the exact, quote, cash position. Now, the bank that's referred to here, cash in bank, is not Bank of America and it's not DCB. It's the bank as in what is referred to by Councilman Caldwell, as well as others, as the big sack of money. This is kind of the, the, the total funding available for all city-related services. All right, and forgive me, being um, in the private sector, owning my own business, um, Normally, uh, one of the things that we would look at is if, if we've got a budget and a budget figure, what, is, what have we spent to date, what revenues have come in to date as compared to what we budgeted. Um, and I appreciate your PowerPoint presentation. I thought that was very professional as well as, as getting this report. But when could the council expect to start seeing those types of reports so that we can, you know, on a regular basis have and keep track of if, the budget was 568 million. Where are we at, and in, in relation to that budget for uh, the fiscal year 0809, and you know more so going forward into 0910, making sure that we can see that on a regular basis as to whatever is being budgeted. That's not an answer that I have right now. Actually, I know that our finance director is working with several members of his staff to assign those those pieces of that financial report. And John, I don't know if you have any estimate at this point of where, when you might have a financial report together. I know that part of putting that financial report together will involve resolving these loan issues and getting them down on paper so that he can finalize that report. Estimate? Care to make an estimate, John? I don't think that answered your question right, specifically. Right. <laughs> that sounds like a 20-month audit type oh, of answer, no. but uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll take it for that. Okay. One of the things that I think the council needs to see is once they adopt the budget, and this is moving ahead, is a variance report to see if, in fact, we're staying within the parameters that have been adopted. 
This budget document is not an authorization to spend, but it's a financial management tool that we use. And unless you have a monthly report that shows the variance report, how close do we are in meeting the expenditures and the income, and knowing when the money comes in, we really don't have any idea uh, where we stand. Staff internally will be watching that on a month-to-month -month basis because we know that we have a lot of income coming at the end of the year, but expenditures occur every month. And so it appears that we're overexpending. But in fact, it's informal borrowing. We're going to have formal borrowing. So we will know how much money we will need to put in those accounts so that we can determine, I'm about to sneeze, I'm trying to <laughs> um, so that we, so that we can prepare a variance report that will show if we're in the parameters of where we need to be. That's a document I'm sure the council would want to see, and that's a that's a goal of the staff of, uh, to do that. Um, I'm back up just a little bit. We, if you borrow from the general fund, and you know the general fund can pay it back. One thing compared to borrowing money from restricted funds for the general funds, knowing that you can't pay it back. Um, and then, of course, in that is that you do not borrow gas tax funds. That's with the state or they'll come in and do an audit and withhold the funds. It's very common to do it both formally and informally, but you must pay the funds back because if you end the general fund, are insolvent. You will read where certain agencies and other counties or other cities have an $8 million deficit or a $10 million deficit that they can do so, but they have borrowing knowing that they can pay it back. Where you get into trouble is if you borrow knowing you can't pay it back. Because technically and legally you can't do that. Simply not allowed to fill the shortfall. At this point in time, we have some extremely critical issues. We know that the general fund is substantially overexpended, substantially overexpended. We know that we can use some borrowing and transferring, and that in all probability, we do believe very sincerely, we get through June 30. That becomes very important. It becomes very important uh, from a point of view that uh, don't, that we're not insolvent, that we in fact are meeting the debts, that in fact we have to show that we meet our obligations, our debt obligations, our bond interests that are due. And this is right in the middle of um, some other very critical financial issues such as the GE contract. We're not exactly sure where we're going on that. We believe we know GE has been very cooperative. There are some things that are beyond our control that could push us to the point where then we know it can't be paid back. That has not occurred, and, and we, we're hoping that it will not occur. So we do appreciate uh, them being very, very cooperative. We are in the process of meeting an obligation with Dr. Pepper. We believe that we will be able to sell the bonds and meet our obligation to build a treatment plant. We're very close to meeting that obligation. We are we have an impediment to borrowing or selling bonds because we had a, an audit with no opinion. The audit with no opinion also put us in default on a lot of the bond issues. When we went into default on the bond issues and also not having an audit, we were suspended as far as our credit rating and can't borrow money, getting us back to paying debt. We can't borrow money to pay debt. We have made a lot of changes. We have brought in a lot of staff people. We have looked at all the issues, and we have formed teams that Doug referred to. The different teams are looking at different issues. And uh, if we have no unintended consequences, between now and June 30, we do get through June 30. June 30 now becomes a priority as the GE contract, as the Dr. Pepper contract. June 30 now becomes a priority. If we get through June 30, with the borrowing, which is perfectly legal, transferring of funds, with the income that we anticipate, that we have every reason to believe it's real and will occur within the next week or two, 
we will then have money in the general fund and we will be able to pay our debts. It also means that we will have, in all probability, a good audit. There were some problems with the past audit. A lot of changes have been made. Other changes are being made. But through the process, we have every reason to believe that even though we have financial problems, the bookkeeping is accurate, correct, and is on the right track with all the corrections that have been made and those that are in the works. That will allow us to get our bond rating restored. That will allow us to have funding. And so we will begin to resolve the issues, we believe. That gets us to June 30. Unless we find another five to six million cutting in the general fund, that's next year find that or make provisions for that, we know then we can't pay it back. If we can't pay it back, we can't enter into an agreement where we know we can't pay the general fund back, which means there are further cuts. The cuts have to occur. So we have a situation where we are going to be looking at the benefits. We believe, I believe, that they need to be eliminated or suspended. There are a lot of good reasons for doing that, and it's creating some internal strife and problems. I don't want to talk about what has happened in the past, because to a large degree it's immaterial. My philosophy has always been that the employees should have this, virtually the same benefits and treated the same. I know that the management employees are enjoying the 401A. My recommendation is that it's going to be eliminated or suspended. All the, pro, all the ones that you saw at the end, uh, my recommendation is that uh, they be suspended or eliminated. Uh, I have been doing spot checking. I have talked to individuals. We have a, a huge amount of uh, cell phones, $120,000. I personally know individuals who come to work and sit by phone all day long and go home, but they still get a cell phone allowance. Those need to be cut and then start again to find out who actually needs it. The auto allowance, $124,000. We have individuals who come to the office, work in the office all day. They get an auto allowance. You cannot pay people to come back and forth to work. It must be a part of the business. And in many instances, the office has a city car. We have a separate study that we have not given you. It's on my desk. We have a surplus of city vehicles that are not being utilized, tremendously being underutilized. So we not only have a utilization program that we're looking at to make a determination, but we're also going to establish pool cars for those who need them. We have virtually new cars with low miles or no miles, very low miles on them. This needs to be looked at. The HMO subsidy is causing kind of a morale problem with the employees because you have two employees working side by side with totally different health benefits. I admire the council's ability to make sure that, to try to make sure that the, that the employee's family is covered. But what, the, what has happened is that if an employee is single or if an employee has only one dependent, they're getting a totally different benefit than an employee who has family because the council is backfilling it and so you have an employee that's, that's a, that has more money being paid for a benefit that is the way some employees look at it is being withheld from that employee. Same thing occurs uh, assuming that you have two employees, they both have the same numbers in the family and they both are covered by insurance, but one is covered by health net and one is covered by Kaiser. You backfill the employee that takes health net, you do not backfill the employee that takes Kaiser, and those employees look at it as being punished for choosing Kaiser. But the fact is that there could be several hundred dollars difference in the benefit the employees are receiving. That needs to be eliminated immediately. And, and it's going to depend upon where we can find the money, whether you go back to the basics and they pay for any additional, or if there's some additional subsidy that can be, can be made. But uh, that's, that's an issue. The benefit cash payment for those individuals who don't take or has half the payment, hot issue. I hate to bring it up, but it's a $300,000 issue. We're still looking at that. Generally, generally, if all the employees are covered, the premium for each employee is lower than if you have a lot of employees who opt out. It is not uncommon for, to use it or lose it. You know, you, you 
right coverage, whether you're covered by someplace else or not. We're trying to look at the overall savings that will be to the employees and particularly to the city. The stability payment is something that I've had the opportunity while working for another city to look at the stability payment. And out of 16 cities that we surveyed, um, five or six, and I still can't remember, five or six had eliminated the stability pay and only Apple Valley and Victorville had the stability pay left. At one time, if you go way back in history, all the studies indicated that public employees were paid not only less than the private sector, but substantially less. And employees would become trained and go into the private sector. Today, when you do the same surveys, it indicates that they're fairly equal, if not paid more in the public sector. And the argument for the stability payment uh, kind of gone away. It's a good benefit. There's a question of, of whether or not it's that much of a savings, but when you look at all of these, these, these fringe benefits that are being paid in the cash form, there's about $2 million that could be saved. Uh, after we do that, we're still looking for another uh, 5 and a half to $6 million. At the present time, we have, I think, a significant number of employees who are retiring. And um, we don't know what that savings will be, but we're putting that together. We also have a significant number of departments who are going through reorganization. They are having to drop programs, eliminate programs, combine programs. As a result, several of the department heads have indicated that eliminating programs or doing away with contracts or assuming functions they also are going to be reducing the number of employees they will need to carry out those functions. That has not been approved. It's not been totally looked into, but preliminarily, uh, many of the department heads are recommending a reduction in the number of employees because of the reorganization. And if, in fact, it makes sense and they do eliminate functions because of the economy, and council knows very well when we canceled contracts, when I canceled contracts, we eliminated a lot of functions and we eliminated contract employees. We have a large number of part-time employees. We will be cutting those back substantially. Part-time, the hours will be reduced. And we also then will be looking at uh, what the final gap is. What I have tried to do is avoid layoffs. Individual council persons have expressed the desire to avoid layoffs. And we have heard the council loud and clear, uh, doing our best to do that. Some of the departments have communicated with the employees and some of the departments have suggested that there be a pay cut for all the employees across the board rather than lay off anyone. We're still studying the effects of that. We have had one department that apparently polled the, most of the employees and recommended a 10% across the board. One recommended a 15% across the board. We don't have those numbers finalized. If we don't do something like that, I don't see how we can avoid the layoffs. It just can't be done, in my opinion. And while that is uh, upsetting to a lot of people, if you assume that we didn't have the other debts and the other commitments that I had mentioned earlier, one must only read the paper to find out that layoffs are occurring in other cities. It's fairly widespread. No one likes it. But we do believe that if we get to the bottom line and still can't close the gap, that we have to propose the reduction in salary after we've eliminated the benefits that we believe that we can eliminate, after we've equalized the benefits that we think is fair then to all the employees. We're left with a reduction or a layoff. And uh, one of the reductions that we would be looking at, uh, and I know that no employee wants a reduction in salary, uh, the fact is that when the council closed every other Friday, there was a 10% raise. That's what it amounted to. And then you had the cost of living, and that was Doug's explanation, uh, with, with the minus 1% cost of living of the 7.7. So the employees are ahead by 7.7, .7, and it may be necessary to eliminate the 7.7. .7. That makes the gap fine. If it doesn't, we still keep doing the best we can. We're working as hard as we can. We're trying to keep the employees together. We don't want to see anyone get hurt in this. But the bottom line is we have to make these numbers match or we get in trouble with other people.
Councilman McEachran, uh, part of the uh, presentation talked about where we were looking at at the end of this fiscal year with regard to uh, our expenditures. And uh, Assistant Director of Finance at Del Moser just whispered in my ear that, uh, in fact, they how they came up with that was using an internal document that they refer to as the budget to actuals document. And it is a document that tracks exactly what you're looking for. Uh, she said that she's willing to try to formalize that a little bit more than the internal document and uh, would be prepared to present that uh, to the council uh, in two weeks. I just want to make one comment. Um, many years ago, when I first became a council member and we were going through the budget, um, there was a loan taken from a restricted fund. From a restricted fund, and um, it was ever, it had to be paid back within 12 months when it was a restricted fund. And I asked if we had paid that loan back to that particular restricted fund. I was told that, well, we do it on paper show it being paid back before the 12 month period and then we just take another paper after that and show a loan. This went on for many, many years. At the end, we wrote that amount off and it was quite a substantial amount. And Jim, I'm, I was very pleased to hear you say that we would make it a formal loan. Formal document. And it would be <clears throat> back, would we make it a time limit on that loan? There would be time or? limits where it's required and there would be interest paid. That's the same as the LAIF account, which is a local agency investment fund where we have invested the funds of the city. That interest rate is normally used on documents. There are some loans that can be made up to five years where you can actually lo uh, uh, loan the money to another entity. I don't know of any documents that are allow beyond the five years, and I will research that, but most have to be paid back within the year if it's. I just wanted to bring that up because that really, at the time, um, I was really upset. And, and I, coming from a private sector like Ryan, I know what my budget is from month to month. I know what's coming in that hasn't received yet. Um, and we lived within that. We have to. I know we're just a small little business, but I firmly believe that most cities should be run like a business. As far as pay cut, I just want to tell you, I cut my son's pay last month. You're laughing. <laughs> he wasn't very happy. I said, well, you know, I love you dearly, but it's either I'll cut your pay or you have to go somewhere else look for a job. And um, I'm not saying that to be sarcastic to staff out there, but at least he has a job. And he does get some money. When things get better, he'll get an increase. He'll get his money that he was getting before. But um, I really I want to thank you all for putting a lot of work in this. And I'd like to see it more often. Like Ryan said, I think this is very interesting, and, and it really does. I've been here a long time, but it sure helps me understand it. I did want to mention one thing. My apologies, Mayor Council, in looking at cuts in looking at where the money has been expended, <coughs> in looking at where other savings can occur. Uh, I'm, you know, there are all kind of rumors on the street. And of course, one of those rumors is that I had looked at closing the George Air Force Base uh, because we're looking at what it costs. That's one of the, that's a big drain. Um, the golf course out there. The golf course. The Not golf. the whole the, no, no, the no, whole no, base. No, 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 the golf, I thought was the golf course. Money. Um, we're, we're still trying to figure out what entities are making and what, what it depends upon who's keeping the books. Oh, <laughs> but at this point in time, when I had suggested, well, we need, we just need to close it, I'll be making that recommendation to council. Uh, then we turned around and re remembered, I was reminded, we have an agreement, we have reclaimed water, we have to put it someplace. So we're adding that factor back in. Also then, there's a factor that if we do close that, it still has to be maintained in a way that it could be opened so that it can't be just closed to go to desert because it would never come back. And if you will remember, for those of you who were here when George Air Force Base closed, 
They required the golf course to have a, it's called a minimal maintenance program, but it was an ongoing maintenance program so that if it ever did open, it could become playable in a short period of time. I did not put those factors in there. We're, we've gone back and we're refining that because it might not be worth it to close it, but we are looking at that. We're looking at everything we can possibly look at. Looking at combining departments, we're looking at a lot of things. So uh, we have incurred uh, substantial savings and we're going to find more savings. We just hope we close the gap where, where we need to be. Well, I, I, don't, dis I don't disagree with, uh, with Terry. I, I, I do believe that we can make those loans between the funds, the fund loans, but they have to be formal. I know that our budget uh, not even sure if those were formalized or not, but I know that look at the numbers, it's a huge amount. They're huge amounts. They will be formalized. Doug is working on that now there will be documents and resolution forms that comes back. It'll it'll give the amounts, the loan from what fund to what fund. It'll show up in the budgets and it'll actually show up in the audits. Mr. Mayor, if I could address one issue that Councilmember Allman uh, brought up, just to clarify for those of you that were here and to uh, inform Councilmember McEachran and remind probably Mr. Cox who hasn't looked at these things in a while. Uh, the uh, loan that, uh, that uh, Ms. Allman was referring to was from the Sanitary District Operations account. It was essentially from property tax monies that were unspent in that account. As you see up on the screen right now, there's about $15 million in that account as we speak. And that amount essentially has legally been transferred uh, from the Sanitary District, which no longer exists, into the general fund as a successor agency. Uh, what LAFCO gave us essentially two options that we could uh, exercise in order to finalize the dissolution of the sanitary district. We could have either used general fund dollars to repay that three and a half million dollars, at which point the district would dissolve and that three and a half million dollars would come immediately back to the general fund, um, or we could simply forgive the loan. In essence, it, it didn't from an accounting standpoint, it, it didn't make a difference whether the loan was forgiven or repaid and then the district dissolved and it became back to, back to general fund. It seemed easier at the time just to simply forgive the loan and not do the formal documents back and forth. Um, and as long as I've got it up on this slide, I do want to bring up one thing. Um, I mentioned that this is sort of the, the guts of the accounting system. Uh, so as you see there, the very first fund listed, 10100, uh, the general fund is not the entire general fund. It is one account that makes up the general fund. Uh, the operating revenue, which is two line items down, would be operating, or, or, excuse me, operating reserve, would be the operating reserve of the general fund. So to say that the, the general fund is at a negative $19 million on the whole would be a misnomer. I would hate for you and the public to, to think that that's where the, the general fund is uh, as of right this moment. Because there's a lot of other funds that make up the general fund. That is simply one line item uh, within our accounting ledger. So how does that uh, three million uh, rollover uh, square with the impairment concept that was created in the last auditing team here? Would we have a three million dollar impairment? Would we have a 15 million dollar impairment? What would we have? Well, none of that involves equipment, uh, so there wouldn't be any <laughs> impairment at all. It was simply uh, uh, it, it was accounting. Assets, it doesn't affect your cash. Wouldn't, wouldn't affect the cash. I was being facetious. Okay. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> if you want to see any other slides at all while we, while you discuss, any options? Well, I don't need to see any more slides, but at the front end of this, uh, Doug indicated he was hoping for some uh, dialogue on two principal subjects. One was the formally policy that allows for the loans and for them to be documented. I sense there's a consensus on that. But he also indicated, if I read him correctly, that he was looking for some expression from the council with regard to these programmed cuts or potential cuts uh, that outlined. And my, my sense at this point is that the effort that's being put in by uh, Jim as the city manager and the department heads and other senior staff. I, 
I think it would be premature and problematic, at least for me, based upon the presentation tonight, to say you ought to cut Program X but not cut Program Y. Uh, I have a great deal of confidence in Jim and in the senior staff, and at least for me, I am prepared to defer to their judgment, including all of the potential program and employee benefit adjustments. The reality is that we've got to close the gap. And for us to come to a council meeting and get, you know, kind of sketchy information because it's not all completed and then to say, well, I think you ought to do this versus that, I doubt if you could get a unanimous position on the council most programs and you might not even be able to get a consensus. But they need some direction on how to go forward from tonight and at least uh, my position is that I'm prepared to defer to them but also indicate that I would vote for whatever package of recommendations that the city council uh, that gets us uh, into appropriate level, and that would include uh, cuts in staff if that became necessary. It would include adjustments in the health care programs uh, if that became necessary. It would include the elimination of perks if that became necessary. I think we owe it to the senior staff to let them know how far at least the majority of the council is prepared to go so that they don't spend their wheels back in two weeks and we say, well, that's a sacred cow and, and uh, adjustment. So that, that is my, uh, my feeling. We pay these folks to run the city. Uh, confidence in them. I'm prepared to support their judgment. Very, very difficult arena. The only other thing I would say, I, I have said the same thing that Joanne has just said. Brian, you know, I too am a small business person in this community, and like everybody else, business is down. We've laid off people in our shop. We've curtailed uh, benefits in our shop. Uh, we've done what we had to do in order to uh, stay afloat. And part of our consideration at my firm was to try and avoid, where practical, where possible, the layoffs. We can do it without layoffs. That certainly would be my preference. But I don't think we ought to take that off the table because we don't know where the numbers are going to go. And I, you know, I, 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 too, say, well, we ought to run it like a business. The reality is you cannot run a city, a municipality, like you run a private enterprise. We have certain mandated things that we can't uh, fiddle around with, public safety being, uh, being one. Now, we can not patch some of the potholes and we can not chase some of the dogs in the neighborhood, uh, things like that. But if you were to make decisions the way you make them in the private sector. There's a whole bunch of things we do we would eliminate just simply because there's no money and we make a conscious decision to subsidize them so we have a quality of life. And I know John Gargan will help me, hate me when I say this, but you know, one should argue, can we afford a full park and recreation program if times are bad? Well, I don't want to cut park and rec, um, but People say we ought to run it as a business, and if we ran it as a business, there's a lot of things that uh, we wouldn't be doing. I so, didn't mean it that technical. I know. <laughs> I, I just... really didn't mean it. John, I didn't mean it that technical. No, <laughs> and I think we need to fill some of these potholes because people are catching me in the grocery store and saying that they're going to come and show us their car. Yeah. I'm only I'm only signaling out to John because he's sitting in the audience, and uh, I'm not advocating any cuts in park and rec. I'm just saying, if you ran it as a business, I understand. I understand. What's the first priority? Police and fire. Yeah. 
No. So if you if you That's did the last priority if then. you did zero based budgeting but budgeting the way I was trained to do it uh, in business school and when I was at Contel, you'd zero out everybody's account, Open and you'd start from scratch, and you decide what the level of public service is going to be. And once you once you fund that, everything else gets the crumbs that may left. But I don't think we're going to do. That. I just. Uh, Add on to what Terry just uh, offered is in a, another opinion, and that is that uh, it's one thing to recognize a gross 10 percent or 15 percent across the board cut, but I think that that would be difficult department by department in itself on the face of it. You've got uniquely trained people that you don't find everywhere that have to be there, whether it's an engineer with a college degree or uh, somebody in accounting or IS or you name it. So. As, as we reach that, that, that 10 percent across the board is probably the identifier gross number, but in terms of the department heads, and this is why I would prefer to de defer to the department heads and, and Jim and, uh, for these ideas, is they're the ones that can make that disproportion. Well, this department A is going to, we're going to take 10 percent, but department B, we're going to take 20 percent, and uh, we're going to do it because we can manage to do that. So I think those type of adjustments that might sound unfair, but those are the kind of adjustments I think are needed so that we have this full package of very professional services that we're offering out there. And some of them we can do it with a different personnel or a different way of doing it. And uh, the, the, the balance doesn't have to be every department 10 percent. Uh, grossly, they have to come out to that number. But I think that's where the adjustments, and that's why I'd prefer to see those department heads and the city manager uh, managing that. Well, as a former staff member, I have the utmost confidence in our staff and having worked with Jim for 21 years, I know that we can, uh, you know, clear this up and uh, even if you consider some of those options, but those will be recommendations from our staff and our city manager. Uh, but the last thing we we'll want to do would be lay anybody off. We have never in the history of the city laid anybody off and we, buy, we have uh, gone through other difficult times. And Jim remembers that, and uh, there'll be there'll be more difficult times ahead of us too. But I'm hoping that we can uh, get over the hump on this one here, and uh, you know, cut to to whatever you have to whatever level. Uh, but the last resort would be any layoff. That would be my recommendation. Okay, we're. Um, we conclude item number uh, yeah, item number two. We now have item number three at the closed session.